Okay, welcome everybody to episode 65 of the Volatility Barometer. Apologies there for the slight delay, a little technical difficulties, but I think we got it figured out. I was actually logged into the wrong username there for a second, which could have been a disaster. Typically, if I do that, it directs everybody to a different place. So we got it all figured out at the last second there. So thank you everybody for joining me here. Hopefully you've had a good trading week. It was a little bit interesting. It did look like the markets were at least trying to perhaps stop just going up week in and week out. Uh, yesterday looked a little bit weak, but it does appear, I just took a glance, that maybe it's just going to reverse course and everything that happened in the last couple of days is going to be fixed today. So it'll be an interesting one because we are going to talk about our wheel of fun trade and it's going to be pretty close. I'm going to resist the temptation to look at the VXX price and I will get into that when we get to that segment. But as always, give the video a like for me. It really does help out on the YouTube. And I'm going to get right into it. Actually, today I'm going to try to do three segments. So I'm going to try to make each one of them pretty short. That middle one where I'm going to just show you how I calculate my VTS performance, that's just coming from a person who asked a question. And I feel like I didn't fully answer it for them. So I'm going to get into that. And then, of course, like I said, we're going to continue the Wheel of Fun. But first of all, we are going to start with a discussion about the M1, M2 VIX futures. You've probably heard of it before. It's arguably maybe the thing that is most often referenced when it comes to volatility trading. So I'm going to try to explain, first of all, why it might actually be important. Sometimes people don't really understand what the term structure means. And then I'm going to get into some interesting data showing you how long we've actually been in Contango. So I'm going to give you some uh, charts and graphs and whatnot, typical VTS style. But let's actually start with a general explanation of what exactly is this VIX futures term structure. Ignore this thing. It's an ad blocker. So a lot of people know that, okay, well, I'm short vol. I'm looking for something called contango. So the very first thing is this is the VIX futures term structure. It is essentially a freely traded market of VIX futures. This one is the August cycle. So it's the first one to expire. And this goes all the way out. There's eight months all the way out to next March. And contango, you've probably heard this term before, contango and backwardation. It is very simple. Contango is just when this second month is above this first month. That's all VIX futures contango means. There's other people who might mistake that for something with the roll yield. It's not that. It's a very, very specific definition where essentially further out contracts are, are priced higher than closer dated contracts. And the reason that we use the front two months is because not a whole lot of people trade the futures. This is typically for, you know, you can if you want, anybody can trade these, but it is typically reserved for maybe more sophisticated investors, institutions and whatnot. But there's an awful lot of people who do use the volatility ETPs. Let me just make sure I'm actually screen sharing. Okay, good to go. Don't want to be make that mistake right out of the gates. All right, so the VIX futures are not commonly traded, but the volatility ETPs are. So we're talking about the VXX, UVXY, SVIX, SVXY, all the usual suspects. They're only holding VIX futures in the front two months. So that's why we're really only concerned with those front two months. There is a product called ZIVB. There's VXZ, there's uh, VIXM. They do the midterm futures, but very, very low volume. We are essentially concerned with just these. So VIX futures contango is when this second month is above the front month. Now, a lot of people don't understand why that is actually important. So really simply, if you think about what a healthy market would look like when you would typically expect equities to be going upwards and volatility to, to be bleeding downwards, we would expect that all the future months going forward are going to be priced a little bit higher than the shorter dated months, right? Because it's unknown out into the future. And the further out you go, the more unknown it gets and the more bad things that can happen. So traders actually need to be compensated for taking on that additional risk of future unknown dates that might actually surprise people. So in a healthy market, this is why VIX Futures Contango is one edge, one small edge among many that might actually be instructive to help you with your short volatility trading. Now, as I've always said, it, it's actually a very small edge. It's not the make or break thing. It's not the one signal that's going to transform your trading. 
What you really want to do is you want to develop five or six smaller edges. And when you apply them all over time, that's when you see some big results. But there's nothing that you're ever going to find in the market that is just the one signal that's just going to change everything for you. It's, it doesn't work that way. But of course, if we're looking for a stable market with volatility that should, all things being held equal, be bleeding down slowly, we would expect that the further out futures are priced higher than the closer months. This is a normal market. So now that you know what VIX futures actually is, VIX futures contango is, let's actually get into some data on how common it is and what you're exactly looking for as far as levels. So the first thing is, you can see right now we're at 5.39. Now this was as of yesterday. Today's a pretty good day in the market, so I would assume it's probably seven or 8% at this point. But the important thing in this little metric is 84% of the time, you can see the rolling percent of days positive, the VIX futures are in contango 84% of the time. So this is a signal that is reflecting a somewhat stable market where you would expect long equities short vol to perform and have a little bit of an edge. It is actually quite common. So what I also like to do is I do like to divide things up into percentiles because just simply being in contango, that includes 84% of days. And as we know, that is actually quite aggressive. You don't want to be in aggressive market positions 84% of the time. It'll probably lead to some pretty big drawdowns. So you could divide it any way you'd like. Fifth percentile, I always think is a very important one to sort of look at, third, fourth, fifth percentile. This is when the market's really melting down. You're talking about minus 5%. That's roughly the range where we would call it somewhat of a market panic, right? The, the lowest fifth percentile. And then your highest sort of green light short volatility range, of course, you know, your mileage might vary. Everybody's going to be a little different with their risk tolerance. But, you know, something you might want to look at is a, is a 30th percentile, which would mean 70% of the time you're looking to be short vol above, say, 3.15, something like that. There's another level down here at 40th percentile. Essentially, what I also like to do with all of the volatility metrics and I would encourage people to do the same, start your own spreadsheet. But what I like to do is check systems of how robust these signals actually are. So you can see the short vol short VXX, buy and hold, right? You might think that that's a great rate of return. And this goes back to 2004. Who wouldn't want to make 27% annual return over the last 19 years, right? Pretty awesome. Unfortunately, you would have had a nearly 93% drawdown and a couple of others in the 90s and high 80s. You know, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a totally, total non-starter when you're talking about buy and hold short volatility. It just doesn't work. Nobody has that risk tolerance. But what I also like to do is check out a system. For example, if you were to short volatility when the percentile of M1, M2 contango is above the 40th percent, so this is 60% of the time your short volatility and then your long volatility in that fifth percentile, right? So below 5%, which as I showed is around 5% backwardation, you would be long volatility. Well, this signal, you can see it is a little bit better. Now the results improve to 36%, still a complete non-starter as far as drawdown goes. Nobody has the risk tolerance to sustain 73%. If you don't know why that is, tune into last week's live stream, catch the rebroadcast. I actually went into some numbers about just how diabolical a 73% drawdown would actually be. You'd be in the hole for years if you actually suffered that. But you can see it's a little bit of an edge, right? This contango level, it's not nothing. It can actually be used to improve your trading slightly. And that slightly, of course, is always the important thing to look at. Now, the sort of the big picture stuff with contango backwardation is mainly that it doesn't go strongly negative very often. So if anything, I would say it's probably a better indicator to sidestep trouble rather than an actual green light for the short ball side. It kind of gives you a slight edge there as well, but it's really, I mean, you can see the picture. Whenever it goes below that backwardation level of about, you know, fifth percentile, the market's really melting down at that point. And certainly you would want to either already be in your safety positions or trying to get to the sidelines as fast as possible because bad things can happen when you basically mimic a buy and hold portfolio. Nobody wants that. So interesting right now 
you might be thinking, well, yeah, 2023 is working out pretty well. It, it just feels like everything's calm and stable. Well, you're not wrong. We've actually been in contango since last October. So this is now the third longest streak in history, 194 days and counting, pretty strong period of the, you know, in air quotes, you can't see me, but the short fall trade. If you want to see what that looks like here, you can see early on, of course, the longest streak was all the way back when VIX futures launched. But since the pandemic, we've actually had a couple of decent streaks, obviously interrupted by some very painful drawdowns and a market that completely broke seemingly where treasuries are, you know, the TLT is down, you know, 40, 50% from its highs. Uh, crazy stuff. You got, you know, utilities, real estate, everything kind of crashing at the same time. It was a rough year, but as far as contango goes, we've had a couple of decent streaks in the last few years. So more or less, if people were able to, you know, just hang on for dear life in 2022, well, there were some short vol opportunities there. And hopefully that will continue. Of course, we all loved the golden era of short vol. If you were around back in, you know, 2012 to 2018, it was pretty fun. And, and hopefully those days can return. You can see we're kind of getting there now. But this is what it looks like. This is all the contango levels for the entire streak going back to last October. And you can basically see when it really started to get strong was right around March. And this next statement is kind of directed at the VTS community. But I've had a lot of people ask me why we are so inactive so far this year. This is my daily email. We really haven't done a whole lot as far as trading this year goes. And, you know, when people are paying for a subscription, they're kind of looking for some action. But to be honest, there's really no reason to change positions. We've been long the QLD, two times NASDAQ, for, you know, almost five months now without changing positions. Why would I change position? The, the position's up 70%. There's I'm not going to just exit just for the sake of exiting, right? There's a lot of these positions that are just, unfortunately, we're kind of just sitting in long equities, short vol, and it's maintained for a very long period of time. But anybody who's kind of wondering, well, why that would be, well, you can see it here. I'm certainly not getting any signals. And like I said, this is a very introductory level. We've got a much more detailed volatility barometer in our, in our community. But uh, yeah, there's just no reason to be actively trading right now. The market is telling us to hold on. That's what we've been doing. So that's what your futures are basically telling you. That remember, it's not just a frivolous, oh, check the VIX futures, contango backwardation. There is a reason. There, the, the reason that that signal is working is because it represents stability. You can see the same thing in a bond equity curve or a, a, a yield curve. You can see it in, in different commodities. Traders always have to be compensated for taking on that unknown risk. But as soon as the markets kind of break a little bit or risk starts to elevate, that relationship no longer holds and you can very easily see the front month futures are being priced very high and the longer ones out are the opposite, right? You'd expect that, well, Three months from now, things are going to settle down. That's what backwardation is showing. So it really is not a make or break, not a, you know, one signal will change the world type thing, but add it to your toolbox for sure. And I would recommend that people start tracking the VIX futures and understanding what it's telling you. Of course, there's better ways to look at it, the, the roll yield. We'll get into that in future live streams, but uh, it is interesting, right? 194 days of contango. You know, we're, we're coming off a, a horrible year in 2022, coming off the pandemic, but volatility is still trying to make its way back to normalcy, which is actually a pretty good thing. So we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned. We'll see how long it lasts. You can leave a comment in the comment section. How long do you think this is going to be? What I kind of want to discourage people from doing without overtly telling you stuff, like obviously I can't give you any personalized investment advice, but the one thing that I would say is, Right around this time, when you see a long period of stability, this is when that contrarian voice in your head is going to kick in. And it's going to start telling you, well, Contango, it's been 194 days. Surely the volatility is going to spike any day now, right? Obviously, the market's going to crash soon. It's been stable for five months, right? I would encourage people not to listen to that voice in their head because you might be right. Maybe on Monday, we see an epic Black Monday type event. 
But typically, and something that I always say is that low volatility begets lower volatility. And what you might find is that it can stay low for a very long period of time, right? What's that old Warren Buffett quote that uh, the markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent? That's not Warren Buffett. That's anyway, whoever can't think of it on the fly here, but something similar to that, where for some reason, and it, it's probably in the short volatility space, especially true that people just love to be the contrarian. They love to try to time those volatility spikes. And, you know, let, let me just flash the chart once again. I'm sure you've seen it a million times. But when you're looking at the long-term chart of the VXX, there really aren't that many periods here where you could say, oh yeah, I, I could definitely thread that needle and go long volatility and make a bunch of money. Really? Because, you know, 90% of the time you're going to be wrong. So what I would say is that it is tempting and probably growing by the day. But don't forget, as counterintuitive as it sounds, the best time to short volatility is when volatility is mid to low, and the best time to go long volatility is when it's very high. I know people hear that and they think, no, that's not true. You wait for it to spike and then you short it down. No, you actually wait for confirmation of signals and you follow the trends. So if you're looking to go long volatility, you are on the exact opposite side of the spectrum. We are miles away from a long volatility signal right now. It's actually short vol, long equities, ride it for as long as it lasts, be ready to move to safety on a moment's notice. That's one of the big advantages to my portfolio and why I've been so successful over the years is just the fact that I can remain nimble and I'm ready to go. Like yesterday, we were almost into the utilities. It was getting pretty close. Yesterday, we almost ducked out of short vol and back into gold, you know? We actually did make this switch into cash in this strategy, and now today we're back into the SPY because the markets have recovered. But my point is always be ready to move to safety, right? But you want to ride the trends for as long as you can. So don't let that contango streak fool you certainly not presenting this live stream as a, here we go, guys, market's going to crash any day now. No, no, no. Long, long, low volatility, calm periods like this, you'd be surprised how frustrating it can be if you're trying to time the reversal because it just week after week, it could just drag on and on. So um, I have for a very long time this year been leveraged net long equities, short vol, and uh, no reason to switch yet. Almost got there yesterday, but not quite. All right, the second segment, this one's going to be really fast, trust me, but I see our friend on Common Sense. This isn't your question, but just to highlight your name. Um, you asked a question recently about how I track VTS performance. So this segment is basically for you and everybody else can listen in. All right, so I just have to load up my other spreadsheet here. You know I always have spreadsheet issues, so let's give it a couple of seconds to spool up here. I got the beach ball going and the Mac. I hate my spreadsheets, but just no matter what I do, no matter how many times I se separate them out and I make 10 of them, they, they all eventually fail, so. Too much data, I suppose. Too many formulas, too many references back and forth. I just keep, you know, anytime it gets slow, I'll just make another one. But essentially, what I want to talk about is he asked a question about how I calculate performance with the official VTS portfolio. And my answer was basically simple. I track it so that it accurately reflects what a real subscriber would get if they followed my daily emails. And there was a sort of a back and forth miscommunication between what formulas I use I thought, you know what, why don't I just go actually show you my spreadsheet? It's far easier than you think. But what I told him is essentially it's, this is how it works, is you would basically be tracking what a real subscriber will do. So if we go to the defensive rotation strategy, just as an example, this is going to be extremely easy because like I said, we haven't actually switched positions in a while. So what I do, what you're looking at here, is how I track performance. It's all based on live trading. It's just a, you know, live trading portfolio. 
So the first here, the green, anytime you see the green, this is my official trades, right? So QLD, of course, it's just marked at the end of the month and then picked up again at the end of the month. There are months that that's not the case. Like obviously March, we were more active. We ducked out of utilities quite a few times. You know, sometimes we do that. And then of course, I'll mark winning trades in green and losing trades in red. But essentially, there are times when it's a little more active, but this is very easy to track because we haven't done a whole lot. So the blue, I also always track the end of day values just to have this record for myself. Later in the future, I can compare the time that I sent the email out versus the end of day prices. It's not, it's basically irrelevant, but I like to track it anyway. And then the official entry is always gonna be the green, right? All the green stuff. Those are my official trades, live trading. And then the exit is the same thing. The green is what I exited at. Again, this is very easy to do. You can see end of day, end of day. That's because I mark it at the end of this month, pick it up the end of next month. But of course, that's not always the case. And then the blue, of course, I'm gonna track the end of day again. And then we go ahead and take the official trade, which is always the green, and then the actual results, right? And you can see, obviously, we've been doing very well. And the end of day and the live portfolio are the same results because we've basically just held the position. But for all of our ETF strategies, this is what I do. I just mark it based on if you bought the QLD and then you sold the QLD. This is, I think, the miscommunication that we had where you weren't sure whether I was using an actual spreadsheet with daily rebalancing. When I'm tracking official portfolio performance, it has to be based on live trading, where if I buy the QLD, it's based on, if I sell it five months later, it's the difference between those two things. Now, I think the miscommunication was that, yes, of course, when I'm trading something like my actual spreadsheet, and this is a very big spreadsheet, I'm not gonna go through it, but for the actual strategy, right, um, like this, for these, this is just for my own tracking. And for these, I do use daily rebalancing because in this case, it's very easy for me to just sub in a different asset class and see what would have happened. So over here, I actually do quite a bit of that. These are This is just testing different things, right? So to give you an example, the defensive rotation safety position, or actually what I could do is I could use strategic, which is actually quite a bit more interesting. Sorry, scrolling, cover your eyes for a second. It makes some people dizzy. But this is cool for me when I use daily rebalancing because you can see what I'm doing here. I'm actually testing pretty much every single asset class I can think of in that threshold of the strategy. And at the end of it all, at all of this testing, I can actually figure out which ones are performing how, right? I can track them all against each other and I can very easily just substitute different asset classes. Maybe I just thought of one in my head and I want to add it to the system. So I'll say, oh, I wonder how such and such would have done. This is why I use daily rebalancing for my spreadsheet tracking. But when it comes to actual performance, it's based on the live trading. Entries, exits, everything is marked at the end of the month. So for example, June, the last price is the closing price in the end of May. For July, it's the closing price at the end of June. This month, we're still going strong with the exact same position we've been in since, you know, the end of March there. And this is how I do it. So hopefully that kind of makes it a little more clear for you that when I kept saying, we, I think we were just talking past each other, that look, it's, it's as simple as you think it is. It's just this minus this. And um, that's how I do it. It's a super basic spreadsheet. And uh, my actual strategy building is based on daily rebalancing top to bottom, 19 year data, I can just sub everything in. Live trading is live trading. It's just what price did I get? How much did that trade make? What allocation percentage was it in the portfolio? Right now it's pretty easy. They're all five, 20% weighting each. Super simple stuff. All right, the third thing here, and this is where I haven't actually checked the VXX price. So we're getting close to the end here. If you want to get your questions in, I'm gonna go through all the questions top to bottom and we'll get through all of those. So if you've got something on your mind, go ahead and get it in the chat section right now. Let's get on to the Wheel of Fun trade that has actually been going for three weeks now. So what this is, is of course a option strategy. And you'd probably be well served to go back a couple of weeks in our live streams and just review this stuff. I went through it in extreme detail, but the Wheel of Fun is, is pretty fun. We're just selling a cash secured put. 
And then of course, when you do that, two things can happen. It can either expire in the money and you'd get assigned your shares or it can expire out of the money and you go right back to step one, you sell another cash secured put. If you do get assigned the shares, which we did, and I'll get into that, then you just immediately sell a covered call on those shares. And again, two things can happen. You can go around a little wheel here. You can either lose your shares because the covered call actually breached and it was in the money, which is a good thing, right? Or it didn't and you keep your shares. You go back here and you sell another covered call. So this is why we call it the wheel of fun. We're basically just trying to sell a put, get assigned some shares, sell a call, lose the shares, go back to step one. And here's the history that we've done in our live streams. So July 14th, we sold a put that was at 2350 and we got 36 cents in premium. The very next week, because these are seven day contracts, we got assigned and we sold a covered call and we got 63 cents for that. That covered call did not expire in the money. So we kept our shares and the week later, we sold another covered call. And that one, I actually dropped it down 50 cents. So I sold the covered call for that one at 23. So here's the moment of truth. I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna check the VXX price. It is at 23.93. So I actually don't have, I, I have a covered call at 23. So obviously I'm going to lose these shares, right? Because that's going to be what is called in the money. That covered call, this system right here is this green box. I'm going to lose my shares now at 23. So I can actually officially mark this and close this trade. So there it is. August 4th, I will get into what I'm going to do in a second here. But the final trade price was 23. I bought it at 23.50. So I did lose 50 cents in this transaction. But the premium that I brought in was actually $1.79. So my total trade profit for the last three weeks on this short VXX put option was 5.5%, which is a pretty good rate of return for a three week trade. And you have to factor in that this is also a strategy that has zero risk for like volpocalypse type spikes, right? If volatility goes up, nothing happens to my trade, right? So it's, you're not expecting to really slam dunk every week or every month. This is the type of strategy that you can kind of overlay the rest of the things that you're doing because there is no fear. Like you go to sleep and you sleep like a baby when you're trading this type of strategy, because really on the VXX, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Well, you lose your shares and you keep your premium, which is great. So five and a half rate percent rate of return for three weeks and no risk. The only risk is the downside if the VXX bleeds down substantially. But remember the selling of the premium along the way week in and week out is surely going to outpace that decay in the VXX. So it actually works out most of the time. And for that reason, why don't we just go back and do it again? So again, if we're doing the wheel of fun, the point is to get back to step one. So we sold the 2350, we got assigned, we sold a 2350 and then a 23 covered call. We finally lost it, we're in cash and we're right back here. I very often, unless the market has substantially changed position, I very often just go from this step right back to the beginning and do the exact same trade again. Sometimes you have to adjust it by 50 cents or something, but you can see with the VXX at 23.95, I can now go ahead and jump in and just do the whole thing again. So if I want to, I can sell a 23.50 put right there, probably get about 45 cents and we'll start off a new wheel. Now, hopefully uh, it'll go down, right? This is a my air quote that you can't see, a quasi short vol strategy, because of course I do want the VXX to go down. The more it goes down consistently, the more premium I can churn with those selling of the puts or selling of the covered calls. So I do want VXX to go down. I just don't want it to just completely crater lower because then it's gonna be maybe difficult to stay ahead in the premiums. But 2350 seems fine to me. So we've been doing 10 contracts. Let's go ahead and open another one right here. Let's sell 10 of these and jump right back in to another wheel of fun. So the mid is at 45, 46. There's no harm trying to do a little bit better. So this is called the 30 second rule that I always talk about in our community. Just go one penny, two pennies above the mid, wait your 30 seconds, it's not the end of the world. You can see I'm trying to get 47 and it's saying it's you know 0.455, I'm not gonna get it. 
but you'd wait your little 30 seconds, drop it one of the smallest increments, try again, right? And there you go. I got it there. So what did I actually fill that at? 46. It's that trade right there. And we are off to the races again with another wheel of fun. So now I'm back at step one. I could do this whole thing right there again. We sold a 23.50 put, and now two things can happen. Let's try to highlight that trade. Let's get rid of all of these. And the new trade is this one. So there we go. Two things can happen next Friday. So of course, tune into next Friday's live stream to see the results. Here's the price, here's the break, here's the break even. If this expires above 23.50, nothing happens. I just keep my 45 cents and I probably do the same thing again. If it expires below 23.50, I'm going to be assigned the shares at 23.50. So if it does decay down to say 22, I'm going to be assigned at 23.50. And I got 45 cents, so my cost basis is gonna be about 23.05. If it expires down here, I might be down after the first week. Now, again, it's probably worth noting that it's very important to use a stop loss in this type of strategy. You'll get derailed a lot on, you know, Twitter traders telling you that, hey, you know, you're just selling put options. You'd buy the stock anyway. What's the big deal, right? Well, the big deal is I only brought in 45 cents of premium. So if this was a normal stock like Apple or something, of course, Apple could crater 50, 60, 80 percent, right? The, you know, Amazon was down over 90 percent in the dot com bust, you know. Side note, that's a lot of people say, oh, if I just bought Amazon in the 90s, I'd be a billionaire. No, you would have sold it in the year 2000 when it crashed 90%. So, um, but anyway, that's just a side note. Uh, with the VXX, not as much risk, but when you're selling a put, you're just bringing in a tiny premium up front. This is a longer term strategy that builds over time. So you do have to make sure that you're managing your risk. And the best way to do that, of course, is with a stop loss. So I use a 10% total value stop loss. Essentially, 10 shares, 10 contracts is equal to 1,000 shares of VXX at 2350. So this is $2,350 of a stop loss. So I can actually just go down here and I can just mark my stop loss right on this trade picture. And we're all the way up here. So we're miles away from that. You know, it's not going to happen in one week. But over time, if cumulatively all the premiums I've collected, if I'm ever down more than 10%, just cut my losses, move on to a new trade. It's no big deal. If you can't take a 10% drawdown on an individual trade, you shouldn't be trading. That's actually a very tight stop loss, to be honest. But I use 10% just because this is a premium generating strategy. I don't want to be all the way in the hole down here. It's just not much fun. I would rather just say, look, 10% is nothing. I'm out. Let's just find a new target. Let's go trade Intel or NVIDIA or something. Um, so that's the deal. We're basically just going to wait five trading days till next Friday. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I hope it's at 2349. That's the ideal ex expiration. I'm going to get my shares assigned at 2350. Price is at 2349. I'm going to sell a monster call at 2350. So that's, you know, if everything works out perfectly, that's what we'll do. We'll deal with everything else. It's fine. Premium collection can... You'd be surprised how much you can chip away at your cost basis, but um, yeah, come on, twenty three forty nine, right? Um, okay, that was all three segments. We did those, and now for the Q and A. So, if you've got anything on your mind about what I talked about today, or just in general, fire away, and we will chip away at these. One thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to cross check the YouTube because there were a couple of really good questions that don't. That are, that are not showing up for me. So let me screen share, because I'm gonna actually go to the YouTube. I don't know why the Ecamm software doesn't show me everything, but I can see this one right here. If a put is in the money, is there a risk of not getting assigned the VXX at expiration? Referring to the wheel of fun. If you're asking what I think you're asking, no, this is going to be distracting. I'm watching myself talk. Okay, I'm going to try to just block that out. Um, no, if you're if you're selling a put option, I mean, are you trying to imply that your broker didn't settle the shares over the weekend for some reason? That would be in uh, some type of error on their part. If you sell a 2350 put and it expires below 2350, you're going to wake up Monday morning with those shares in your account. That's how that works. 
And the same would apply for stocks, ETFs, everything across the board. Options are settled that way. So if you let something expire in the money, an action by your broker will be taken. You will either have long shares, you'll have short shares. If there's an issue with your account register, you know, your regulations, then they might actually liquidate something on you. But yeah, you you don't want to let things expire in the money if it wasn't part of your plan because you are going to get an action taken. So no, the wheel of fun happens that way that over the weekend, those shares will settle and you will you will get those shares. Alexander asks, would you golf with someone that shoots 150 or 200? So I think my wife's watching now. I wonder if she can just give a little thumbs up if anything I'm about to say is remotely true. But I'm actually a really good golf buddy because uh, number one, I don't, I'm not that guy that gives out advice, unsolicited advice. If you ask me, I'm more than happy to help you, but I'm not that guy that's going to every bad shot you hit. Oh, you know what you did? Your elbow was all messed up and look at your grip. It's a nightmare. You know, I don't do that stuff. So if you ask me a question, I'll help you. If you don't, I'll go 18 holes and not say a word. It's fine. You know, obviously, you know, presumptuous, I suppose, but I'm a professional. I am better than you and I could probably critique everything you're doing, but I don't do that stuff. Even with my wife, I mean, just, there's, there's only so much you can teach somebody. Maybe one swing thought per day for her. I just tell her, you know, one thing to focus on, but that's it. I just like to get everybody having fun. I don't care what you shoot. Your ball doesn't affect my ball. And if somebody you're playing with, if you shoot 150, aside from being painfully slow, which if you're shooting 150, you probably your two main goals are number one, have fun. Number two, don't be slow. But as long as you're at a reasonable speed, I don't care if you're hacking it around. How does that affect me? I mean, obviously I have to be mentally strong enough to deal with the fact that not everything is exactly how I would want it, right? It, I don't care what you shoot. We could still have fun. So everything about me and golfing with me, if, you, you know, if, if you're in the city that I'm in and you wanna play with me, trust me, it's, it's zero pressure you're not going to feel rushed. You're, you're just going to have a good day. It's always top priority is just having fun. So don't ever be afraid of playing with other people and certainly don't be afraid of playing with me. Uh, I don't care if you shoot 150. All right. Did I screen share? How do you deal with whipsaws in your trading? Looking backwards, did you have a lot of those in 2022? Yes. Have you tried to come up with something to recognize whipsaws before they happen? So honestly, super common question here. And who likes, I mean, nobody likes whipsaw. It's one of those things. What he's referring to essentially is you take a trade and then pretty shortly afterwards, either the next day or maybe a couple days later, the market reverses and that trade loses money and you have to actually switch your position. Call this whipsaw. And it can go back and forth sometimes too. The thing you have to understand, and the more experience you get trading, whipsaw is impossible to avoid. Now, obviously, there are things that you can do to reduce it, right? One thing that you can do, and one thing that I do at VTS, is I definitely make sure that I'm having my thresholds at levels that don't trigger very often, right? You wouldn't want to short, you wouldn't have your, your flip point from equities to cash be at like 40% vol or 35% vol because that's going to cross an awful lot. But what you will find at about the 60 to 65% level, which is kind of where we play in our portfolio, 55 to about 64, somewhere in that range, it's oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes either coming or going. It's either the market's going from stable to unstable, or it's going from unstable to stable. And so there's one thing you can do. You can choose thresholds that don't flag very often. But look, you're trading. It doesn't matter if you're trend following, if you're swing trading, if you're day trading. At some point, you've got to pull the trigger, right? You can do all the planning you want. You can have all the best intentions in the world. But at some point, it's not investing unless you actually get your money to work. And the moment you get your money to work, everything is unknown going forward. So how do you fix whipsaw? Well, don't trade very often, right? Day traders are highly subject to this type of thing. They call it a losing trade, but us trend followers, we call it whipsaw. They're getting whipsawed left and right all day long in five of their 10 trades. They just call it a losing trade, but we call it whipsaw because 
our goal is to stay in the same position like I have in the QLD for you know five months now. That's the goal. So whenever we get bounced around and it's a single day trade, like yesterday, I got out of the SPY and into cash in one of our strategies. It, it's the strategy that moves to safety the quickest, and yesterday just flagged. So I got out of SPY and I went into cash. Well, today the market's up, you know, what is it? Like 8.8 or something? It was, it was just rocketing earlier, 0.55 still, and we're right back into the SPY. This is called whipsaw, right? I don't call that a losing trade. I call that whipsaw. Well, what could I have done? I've got to allocate my money. So there's always going to be a line where you're going from not in to in. You can move the line around, you can call it something else, you can try to figure out ways to avoid getting into trades. What are you gonna do? We're investors, we can't see the future. When I get into that new SPY trade, which I did when the email went out an hour ago, well, the market's uncertain, isn't it? I don't know what's gonna happen Monday. I'd be arrogant if I pretended I did. So what I'm hoping happens is now that I'm back into the SPY position, I'm hoping that we get some stability for a few days. But if Monday opens up and it's an ugly day in the market, you know, knock wood, well then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna move right back into cash, obviously. That's what the system tells me to do. I have no control over this. Luckily, I was in some trades that lasted five months. Sometimes you're only in trades that last a day. It, it is what it is. I know what you're getting at, and it's very frustrating when you get whipsawed. You think, oh, you know, I was in this trade, I exited, and look at that, the very next day, it didn't work. It immediately failed, and he's right back into the same position. Yeah, welcome to trading. That's what happens. It's, if you can't deal with that, you can't allocate capital, right? I've seen the you know token golf analogy again for my one golf analogy per live stream. I've seen people get paralyzed golfing because they're just thinking about so much, the yardage, the wind, and you know, the, the, the temperature, the, the lie they have, is it gonna fly, is it gonna spin extra? They get paralyzed, they can't even pull the trigger. At some point, you've got to get that ball in the air or you're not even golfing anymore, right? So yeah, it could be a bad shot, but you've gotta hit it anyway. You've got to let that go. And every trade we get into, it might be a loser, but you've got to get into that trade if your system tells you to. Whipsaw is just part of the game. That is just the entry price of being an investor. It, it is what it is. So I, I of course, I, I do the best I can to find ways to mitigate it. And our systems change positions at different timing. But at the end of the day, we get whipsawed, you know, I'm not going to say often, but it happens. It is part of the system. So what is the mathematical? I'm just going to double check to see if my, there we go. We're back. So now I can highlight these again like this and you can read them. What is the mathematical rationale behind setting the upper limit of the volatility barometer at about 90% and the lower limit at approximately 10%? Are there any benefits to doing this? No. So just to get everybody up to speed, what he's talking about is my volatility barometer. Just the way that it's set up for me using percentiles and moving averages and you know rolling momentum and whatnot the highest value that it's ever been is just shy of 91%. And the lowest it's ever been is right around 13%. So he's asking, like, is there any benefit to doing this? No, it's just the number is the number. So what I could do is, because it's a, it's a calculation and it's created by me, the volatility barometer is just 13, 14 now, volatility metrics combined into the same indicator. So one number gives me the level of volatility in the market, not the VIX, not the VIX futures, not M1, M2, like we talked about before, 14 metrics all combined telling me the best possible robust trade signal. Um, designed by me, I could, I could do a very simple calculation and make it so that the highest value actually hits 100 and the lowest value hits zero my brain doesn't care what I'm looking at. It, I don't care if the highest is 91 or the highest is 100. For people following my work, I suppose, and I've talked about this in the past, it might make more sense to them. They're like, well, if the pandemic was 91, I can't even imagine what 100 is, right? Well, 100 never happened. 91 was March 16th, 2020 pandemic. That was the highest level ever, right? I could rework it if people wanted to look at it differently, but I just look at numbers as numbers. I don't look at it as, 
you know, it's, it's got to be nice and neat and tidy on thresholds. So that's the only thing. There's no advantage. That's just the number it spits back at me. And I'm the head trader at VTS. If it makes sense to me, then that's what we use. But I have often thought about it, you know, maybe, maybe just visually, maybe just, you know, for marketing purposes, maybe it would make more sense to just rework those numbers a little and, and make sure that the best and worst is touching the I guess what makes sense. Zero percent should be for what was the date? November seventeenth, two thousand seventeen, something like that. Um, we'll see. We'll see what I do with that. But no, no advantage at all. All right. I think Brent shorted the VXX straddle in his short vol series. Well, I must be missing something. So let's go check the YouTube channel because that doesn't make sense. That seems to be a random question out of nowhere. Oh, I missed one. There we go. Look at that. Thanks, George. I did miss one. Let me just figure out how to do this. What am I looking at? There it is. I know you like to look at all your option strategies to be defined risk, but I'm curious about whether you've ever made a short naked trade, short naked call or short naked put. Short naked puts, yes, often. Uh, on, on VXX and UVXY, I feel completely comfortable selling short naked puts. I call them cash secured because in my margin account, I always have margin to cover everything. But technically speaking, I'm selling naked put options. And what that would look like for me personally, because there are times when I'm actually pretty strong net positive the market, I also, for the VTS community, I also calculate our portfolio beta to the S&P 500. So beta is a measure of shows the relation of one security and how it moves in relation to another. So our portfolio in relation to the S&P 500. Right now, we're at a beta of about 0.93. So we're basically in line with the S&P 500 as far as directional exposure goes. But sometimes I can get actually much stronger than this. So for me personally, I actually have no problem in that case just using some of the buying power in my account and throwing on a bunch of what you would call naked short put options on VXX or UVXY. And of course that is counter to say a long two times equities position. Short VXX put is the opposite directional exposure to that. So there's no doubled up danger. This is the problem with, I'll go on a little side rant here, but it really bothers me because of how reckless it is. You might see sometimes on Twitter, people talking about overlay strategies, or, you know, they'll, they'll market it as this great thing where you can actually keep your full portfolio intact and you can use your margin to trade another strategy without having to sell the positions in your portfolio, All right? This is an age old thing. We just call it an overlay, but they have certain clever words that they use to market it. And it makes it sound incredible. Like it's going to boost my performance. Well, the problem is the vast majority of strategies and asset classes and pretty much everything people do in the investment world is actually positively correlated to the stock market. So what's going to happen when you add an overlay to something that is correlation wise, positively skewed already to the portfolio that you didn't sell? Well, you've just added risk for no reason, right? The markets crash, your portfolio goes down, the overlay is correlated to your portfolio and it goes down. So now you've lost more money than you actually would have having just the original portfolio. So the question you need to ask is, what are you overlaying? Are you overlaying something that is positively or negatively correlated to the stock market? In this case, like I'm saying, short naked VXX puts and calls are actually negatively correlated, mathematically extremely strongly correlate, negatively correlated with everything else that I'm doing in my portfolio. So I can basically do this at will. And the worst thing that happens is the losses in this, if the VXX continues to bleed down, the losses in this are covered by the gains in, you know, QLD, SPY, SVXY, everything else we have. You'd want to measure it so you're not drowning one of them out. But yes, you can do an overlay if it is mathematically negatively correlated to the rest of your portfolio. That is the important key. And so the other side of your question, would I ever do this with naked calls? No, because a naked call 
is positively correlated to my two times net long equities exposure. If one of them goes bad, the other one goes bad, and now we're screwed, right? Now I've just doubled up on garbage that's going the wrong direction, and this is trouble. So whenever you hear people talking about these overlay strategies, you need to see a track record, independent track record of the overlay strategy. You cannot just read the marketing material because it's gonna sound brilliant. It really is. It's gonna sound like, why didn't I do this for the last 20 years? I could have just been overlaying. I could have just been, um, you know, I don't wanna say it because there's that, you know, probably copyrighted wording, but there's clever ways to say this online and on Twitter. But before you put one single dollar into any of these strategies, you need to see a detailed track record of that overlay. So to answer your question, that's a long side tangent, as I always do, ranting about other things. No, I don't. Now, short naked puts, I don't even consider a, a naked position, really, because there's only so far so fast that it can go down. And as long as you're collecting enough premium, you can't really get into too much trouble selling puts on VXX. But everything else, there's no reason to ever do it because selling anything naked and I've talked about this a million times. Again, here we go with another side tangent, but talked about this a million times that let's take a naked call on the UVXY, for example. I always say this is a rookie mistake. This is a garbage trade. Nobody should ever do it. And people misunderstand me and they think what I'm saying is, well, you're definitely going to blow up your account if you sell naked calls on the UVXY. And while that's true for most people, that's not actually what I'm saying. There's a reason that you shouldn't sell naked calls on UVXY even if you don't blow up your account. It's because it's a terrible trade. The margin requirements on a naked call is the most cost effective or cost inefficient strategy you can possibly do by a mile, all right? One contract is gonna tie up a bunch of capital, but the benefit that you can get from a naked call is just that tiny premium that you brought in. So in the last five, six months, the UVXY has absolutely collapsed Somebody who's been repeatedly selling naked calls is just picking up tiny premiums along the way. The UVXY itself has gone down 10 times faster than the premiums you're bringing in. So you've gotten into a situation where it's the most capital inefficient trade, and it's also the least profitable trade, and it's also the highest risk trade. What kind of rookie trader thinks this is a good deal? Obviously, any strategy that you do could be made to make money. The point of investing is not to make money, like positive return. Sure, if you sell naked calls on UVXY and you're very good at it and you're very consistent and you know what you're doing, yeah, maybe you'll make a profit. But trading is about making the most amount of profit with the least amount of risk. That's the game we're playing. We're not playing the absolute value plus or minus and that's it. No, there's a massive gray area there. So why would somebody ever sell naked options when it's the least efficient, least profitable, highest risk? No thanks. There's a million other ways that I could take the same exposure, short volatility, efficiently, and make way more money and take on way less risk doing it. Obviously, experience counts for this. I've been doing this for 17 years, but when I see people selling naked options, I just think, you haven't done the math, my friend. You got more work to do if that's what you think an efficient trade is, because it is not. You think, oh, this is so easy. I'm just selling calls. I'm just collecting money. Yeah, massive risk, terrible payout ratio, awful risk reward ratio. Why, why would anybody do that? So I don't do that. But I do exclude, to get back to your original question, short puts on VXX when the rest of my portfolio is highly exposed to net long equities. Yeah sell puts at will. It, it really, you know, don't do it with 100% overlay or anything, but 20, 30% overlay, it's, it's totally fine. It boosts performance. So yes, George, thank you. That you answered his question. I, I figured this out. Okay. Apart from a simple, oh, my phone's blowing up. Apart from a simple percentage rank, 80%, are there any other factors that trigger the implementation of long volatility strategies, such as VIXM, parabolic SAR indicator, or momentum? In the strategic tail risk strategy, no. 100% volatility barometer. Over 80%, we go long vol. 
Doesn't happen very often. I mean, you can see here's the chart. It, over 80%, I mean, we're just trying to clip the very tops of like the Volpocalypse, the pandemic, the European debt crisis, things like that. It very rarely triggers above 80, but when it does, strategic tail risk is gonna go ahead and jump into that long vol. Happens very rarely. I think last I checked, it's at 2.76% of trading days. So we're talking about less than 3% of trading days were long volatility. But yeah, it happens over 80%. If you're talking about this strategy, getting into the VXZ, this is based on a different set of indicators. So of course, I don't use the same thresholds for all of my strategies. Every one of them has its own trading signals, metrics that it looks at, highest priority metrics, lower priority, different momentum, different thresholds. So this one isn't so clean. It's not just look at the barometer and get the number. It's actually, it's based on an internal strategy that I've designed. But it's not, it's not overly far off that 80% barometer, which again, flags very rarely. So this is not like we're, um, it's not like we're, again, this is probably getting back to the original question, why that volatility barometer for people outside of ETS, it might make sense for me to restructure it. So a hundred is a hundred and zero is zero. Because when I say anything over 80, we're going long vol, people might actually get the impression we're going long volatility 20% of the time. We are not. It's actually two point, what did I say, 2.76. That rings a bell. It's probably not exactly right, but yeah, very, very rarely. But just going through these live stream questions, it's becoming apparent to me that, yeah, you know what, maybe it's time for a change. Maybe, maybe it would reduce the number of questions if I reworked the barometer a little bit. All right. I think the Wheel of Fun also uses naked puts, calls. Do you use them hoping you get assigned? So there's, um, you probably asked this after I went through the presentation, but um, let's see if we could put 30 seconds on the clock and see how fast I can get through this for our friend. Nope, look at that. I opened my uh, Adobe Premiere. Okay, put 30 seconds on the clock starting now. So <laughs> what we're trying to do, yes, this is technically speaking a naked put option on the VXX or whatever you're selling, like Apple, Google, whatever it's on. We are kind of hoping that we get assigned because then we can continue on with the process. In my experience trading this, I've been doing this for probably 15 years now, the Wheel of Fun. In my experience, it is better to try to get to the covered call stage. A lot of people think they wanna play in this game down here where you're just selling naked puts that expire worthless and you get to keep your premium and you just keep churning over and over but actually you will find that you'll build more long-term profit if you're not afraid to actually get assigned and jump into those covered calls because these can be extremely aggressive. Remember, we are not trying to profit based on the underlying capital appreciation of the security. We are trying to benefit based on strictly premium collection. So in that case, we need those shares to sell the beefy aggressive covered calls on the other side to get out of the position. So... Uh, Technically speaking, the put option would be naked, but like I said, margin accounts, it's always going to be covered and cash secured. The covered call is always covered because it's based on the shares you hold. So nothing is naked and nothing is high margin requirement for this strategy. Uh, some of them is zero margin requirement, of course, if it's just a covered call. All right. Great comment from our friend here. Can't read that? Looks awesome. Thank you. I think the wheel of fun... Did that one already? Wife, you were supposed to confirm whether I'm a good golf buddy or not, not just say hi to me. Say hi to me in 20 minutes when I call you. Um, what political financial events or precursors led to the 2018 Volpocalypse? That's an interesting question. I can tell you what happened during Volpocalypse, right, on that day. I mean, it's, it's easy to explain why VIX futures spiked the way they did. Um, I've actually got three videos on the YouTube channel breaking down why it happened, why in the future, at least as of now, we're not actually subject to the same dynamics and volatility space is much safer these days. But as far as what, you know, because I was on Twitter actually a week before the Volpocalypse happened, telling people to be careful. Like the volatility metrics were screaming red flags. I didn't know a week later it was going to collapse. So I ended up looking like a bit of a genius back then. But all I was really doing was just following my system. And towards the end of January, 
Like we were out in full safety by January 30th on across the board and all our strategies. So we didn't lose anything during that Volpocalypse. If your question is, what events led me to get out of the trade a week earlier and not be subject to that terrible day? I don't know. I don't really think of things that way. I don't really add any macro overlays to my strategies. It's purely quant based. It's by the numbers, volatility only. Even if I'm trading bonds or gold or utilities or real estate, I'm still using purely volatility metrics to get my signals. I just think that it's by far the most consistent place to go. Because if you look at any other metrics in the market that people use, there's a very big difference between them across time. So if you're looking for some type of MACD or, you know, Bollinger Bands or something like that, the European debt crisis bands might look a whole lot different than the Volpocalypse ones are because the starting point really matters, right? If you're looking for some type of moving average crossovers, obviously it matters how high and low you're starting from, right? You could get a crossover that happens just dead on perfect, but then you could also get one that, look, the market was doing great. It was way above the, the moving average, and it took the event to push it below the cross, right? So those are not reliable. But what you find with volatility metrics is it doesn't matter how much time goes by. 2011, 88% and above on my volatility barometer, it hit at the exact same level in the European crisis, in the China scare, in Volpocalypse, Q4 2018, the pandemic. It's all the same to me. I'm looking at a barometer that hits those levels consistently across all of time, but other metrics don't do that. So everything I do is volatility related because it's the only thing that's consistent. My barometer looks exactly the same during the pandemic as it looked during every other volatility spike. So very reliable. Um, no need for macro overlays. I don't know what led to that. I really don't. On the day, it was just a liquidity crunch, pure and simple. There was $5 billion of assets under management that had to get pumped through the VIX futures. And that's a lot of buying of VIX futures. Remember, the VIX spiked about 115.6% that day. And yeah, that's going to put a lot of pressure on that end of, end of day rebalancing. That's what happened. Everybody forced by the methodology of the underlying volatility ETPs had to do their rebalancing. And uh, it just cascaded upwards over time because, you know, a lot of people come to the question, well, if some of them are short and some of them are long, surely they're canceling each other out. I guess what people don't really understand is they're all buying the same futures. The long volatility funds, the leveraged long ones have to buy the futures to get their exposure back for the next day so that they're net long the futures and the short ones they also have to buy those same futures to cover their positions that are going badly to get their exposure the next day so it's actually all going in the same direction and they're targeting the same futures the vix futures market in 2012 when these products launched it was plenty big enough to handle the volume because nobody knew what vol etps were but in 2018 it was the most popular trade on the market, one of them, right? It was just out of control. Everybody and their dog was shorting volatility with these products. So $5 billion has to go through the VIX futures market in a 15 minute window at the end of the day. Yeah, big trouble. So they have fixed all that. I don't wanna give people the impression that you know this is this just gonna happen again, Volpocalypse 2.0. I'll let you know, follow my live streams. I'll let you know if the the relationship between the VIX futures and the vol ETP space is getting a little bit precarious. And when it does, surely I will be giving the warning signs. Way back mid-2017, I was telling people this is going to happen. I actually have a video where I showed about 15 of my comments like on the screen in the comment section saying that this thing can terminate in a single day. Be careful. Like We're getting dangerous. Um, go through my YouTube channel and it, it's all there. I was calling that way ahead of time. Now I'm actually saying the opposite. The volatility space has been decimated. The end of day rebalancing has been fixed largely. The new products, SVIX and UVIX are structured much better and they're using different underlines. They're using short vol and long vol index. They're not using, you know, back then they were all using the SPVX, you know, STR index. It's fixed. So as of now, we're kind of safe-ish. Still volatility, still keep your stops tight, get ready to move to safety. But yeah, we're, Volpocalypse is not going to repeat anytime soon. 
Okay, I would love, how long have I been going? I feel like today's there's an extra large number of questions. I would love to hear your take on this. Okay. Is there an advantage disadvantage to follow the VIX 9D instead of the VIX since the VIX follows the 30 day vol and nine day vol would react better? No, I would actually encourage you not to follow, follow the VIX 9D for that reason. The VIX 9D moves too quickly. It just does. So in my daily email, of course, I, I think there's a wealth of information stored inside the cash term structure. Like you're saying, the VIX 9D is a nine day. We've got the VIX at a month, the VIX 3M, the VIX 6M, and even a 1Y. Now I wouldn't use the 1Y. It's a little bit too far out. You're gonna get some less than robust numbers that far out. But the problem with the 9D is like you said, it moves really fast. So you're gonna get a lot of false positive signals. You're gonna get a lot of whipsaw. There was a question earlier on whipsaw. If you're focusing on the nine day, you're gonna get a ton of whipsaw. In, in the trade one day, out of the trade the next day, it's gonna happen all the time. Now, if you do the 6M, it's gonna be slow, right? This is six months out. And volatility doesn't move that quickly six months out. It moves quickly at the nine day. So you gotta kind of balance the two. And what I think, what I always recommend is people kind of target, as far as metrics go, I would say the VIX to the VIX 3M crossover is probably the best one, right? Um, this is just private for the VTS community members, but I do go through this and explain, you know, kind of why this one is the one that people should be focusing on. But uh, th three months to one month, what you're gonna get there is less reactive metrics. You're absolutely right. The nine day is gonna give you the signal almost immediately, but the 3M will allow you to be quick enough without getting whipsawed all over the place. So the VIX 9D, I basically don't use it um, very rarely. I show it in the term structure because it's important, but I would focus in on the relationship between the 30 day VIX and the 90 day VIX 3M. Do you see short-lived backwardation around major news events, Fed decisions, CPI? Basically, do these news events cause false signals during the day? <clears throat> so not all the way to backwardation, but typically there is a little bit of defensive positioning going on when you get closer to these binary events. And every, now almost all of them are non-events, right? This is, if you have experience with trading macro events, they're almost always a dud, nothing happens. But people still hedge around them, which does mean that the volatility metrics will move a little bit. And every now and then, one of them will really surprise. I always follow the signals. Now, getting back to our friend who asked the question about whipsaw earlier, something that does add additional whipsaw is those macro events. But I'll give you an example. Back in Brexit, right, it's a very binary event, but I remember trading through the Brexit and the general vibe was that it was gonna be a non-event. And I remember a lot of the volatility traders that I was watching were loading up on their short vol trades. And again, I was on Twitter, you should follow me on Twitter because I'm a little bit more opinionated on Twitter than I am on YouTube, just based on the, um, I guess, <laughs> you know, political leanings and liberal biases and whatnot. But I was telling people flat out, this is a mistake. Sometimes fear rises for a good reason. And for me, I followed my system and I moved to cash and Brexit was a horrendous day in the market. Remember, it was considered a major shock that it went that way and the market absolutely cratered. But I didn't lose anything. I was safely in sidelines in cash, but it was a it was a portfolio melting disaster for anybody who was not paying attention to those signals when they come. So my theory is I don't mind introducing a little bit of whipsaw and I don't mind looking like a little bit of an idiot sometimes. Like yesterday, for example, when I moved to, out of the spy into cash in one of our strategies and today I jumped right back into it. Well, I guarantee you my email inbox right now has people saying, what's the deal? Like, what, what are you doing? Clearly you don't know what you're doing. There's going to be somebody asking me a question like that. Well, my response is that strategy is not a back test. That is my portfolio's live trading. We've been at this for 12 years now. And I'm not the type of person that 
publishes all my wins and hides all my losses. I just kind of tell it like it is. I don't brag when I do well and I don't make excuses when I do bad. But I don't actually mind being on the wrong side of trades. And sometimes people hear that and they think, well, wait, you're not trying to win all the time? I'm really just allowing for the possibility that one out of five, one out of six, one out of eight times, it can melt your portfolio if you don't do the right thing. So my theory is, I'm gonna do the right thing 100% of the time. I'm always gonna to try to be in the right trade in the moment. And if that means that if I get a one day whipsaw because the market gets scared about a certain binary event and everybody hedges and I move to safety, and then the very next day, nothing happens and I'm right back into the market, so be it, right? So be it. That is far better than trying to explain people, oh, sorry, you're down 60% in one day because you were short vol with conviction because you thought it was gonna be binary and I thought it was gonna be binary. Sorry, my bad. I'd rather take a bunch of small paper cuts than just melt my portfolio in a day. That's just not how I trade. So um, yes, to answer your question, I don't know if I nailed it for you or not, but yeah, you're gonna see, it won't go straight to backwardation. Like let's say there was a binary event tomorrow. Markets are stable enough that it's not going to go all the way negative, but it certainly would creep down because people have to hedge and people get scared and sometimes people move to safety. And I'm a conservative investor, so we would probably be leaning, you know, one foot out the door, so to speak. You're going to see it. And as a trader, you're going to be tempted to front run. You're going to be tempted to predict what's going to happen. I would advise against that. Just Follow your system as if you're a cyborg and sometimes you look like an idiot, but it's better to look like a little bit of an idiot than a complete fool that melted half your portfolio, you know, once every five years. Don't do that. Bad things do actually happen in the market and signals arise, right? Don't ignore them. Okay. How often do you rebalance your entire portfolio to reset each? Almost never. So good question, Darren. Um, essentially, we use what's called constant or what I call. I don't know if it's what they call. I just made it up. Constant portfolio rebalancing. So as an example, this strategy is 20% of the portfolio, of course. And what ends up happening is because the strategy averages about two to three trades per month on average, like you can see from before when I showed my live performance and how I track that, um, yeah, we've been holding the same position for a while, but there are times when we're bouncing around. So the portfolio, every single time there's a new trade, I just dedicate 20% of the total value to that new trade. So it gets rebalanced on its own every single time we change position. And since it happens on average two to three times per month, we just constantly rebalance the portfolio. I never have to do anything outside of my signals. Having said that, the QLD has been up so much this year. This strategy is up so much this year that I actually did do an override rebalance about two to three weeks ago, where I basically sent it out to the community. I said, look, this, the QLD is crushing it. Now the tactical balance is, is significantly more than 20% of our portfolio because we haven't taken a single trade since March that I actually just overrode the system and we rebalanced back to 20 and everything was fine. We did that a, a few weeks ago, but 99% of the time, there's going to be some trades throughout a month or two months maybe where everything just gets rebalanced back to 20. Every new trade, you just take your net liquidation value, divide by 20%, allocate that to the trade and you're rebalanced, pretty easy. I've got a question. That's what I'm here for. There is a new volatility metric introduced by SIBO. VIX one day, interesting stuff. Did you have a chance to do any back testing? Will this metric be used to include in the barometer? No. This is purely a response to the massive uptick in zero DTE options, right? It just, it's a pure marketing tool, but on such a short-term basis, it is completely irrelevant. That signal, that metric will not be used for anything useful. Um, it's just it's just designed to fail from the start. So I would honestly just skip it. It's You can see it's not in my daily email. 
it's not going to be, I mean, I can't say forever. It might make it look pretty if I kind of complete the term structure and I put the one day in there, but come on, one day, that's meaningless. I was already telling our friend from earlier that the the VIX nine day is not overly useful, but a VIX one day is, is just comically useless. Okay. Now I'm looking forward to the VXX crush Excel formulas. Um, yeah. Will I actually give the formulas? Probably. I'm planning to give out a spreadsheet download just for everybody publicly because I talk about these metrics so much. I might actually just prepare a little something and give everybody a link for it. So tune into that. Do you ever sell covered calls on your strategy positions? Nope, we don't because covered calls are terrible. I mean, essentially, covered calls is a marketing tool that I think people use, but in general, you're not reducing your downside risk because the covered call premium is so tiny as in, you know, per, as a relation to the underlying position. So you're not reducing your downside risk at all, but you're obviously you're extremely capping your upside gains. So for example, the QLD, I don't know what we're up. I'm just going to take a stab at it, but probably like 75% this year or 70% for sure. If we were to be selling covered calls, I would have just been buying them back repeatedly every single week. We would have probably not even made any money. You're capping your losses. And I'm a trend follower. I'm not a day trader. So the last thing in the world I want to do is do something that limits my upside, but doesn't reduce my downside. If for some reason, a covered call brought in so much premium that it actually significantly insulated my downside, then I might change my tune here. But covered calls by design are being sold when volatility is already low. The further out of the money you go, the tinier the pennies you get, you can't stay ahead of the game. And that's why if you look at all these indexes, there's indexes out there that do roll in covered calls. They're not good. You just look at the results. It's, it's not a winning strategy. You, the, you do not want to cap your losses or cap your gains when you're a trend follower. That is counterproductive to what we're trying to do. And little tiny covered call premiums here and there is not going to change the overall profit. It's coming from the trend. It's not coming from the 30 cents that I can get every time I'm holding something. So no, we don't do that. If you wanted to do that, then what you're looking for, of course, is the wheel of fun. Because the wheel of fun is puts and calls, covered calls are part of it, but now this is completely different dynamic. When you sell a covered call, the goal is to get rid of your shares. The goal is to sell the biggest, beefiest covered call you can get so that you're gonna lose those shares and you're gonna bring in the, you know, the largest premium you can. Now, all of a sudden, the underlying security means nothing to me. It is simply a vehicle to get that premium into my account. So this makes perfect sense if you're a covered call seller. Do this, be super aggressive on that covered call. But if you're talking about trend following, I do not want to cap my gains on these, you know, the QLD, the short vol. It's the last thing I want to do. I've had a short vol position in that strategy. I think it was, you know, several years ago now, but I think the biggest winning trade we had was something like 120%, uninterrupted, did not exit the position, 120% gain, shorting volatility after, you know, four or five months of just sitting there. Last thing in the world I want to do is just every week be losing money on covered calls. I'm trying to find those trends. I'm not trying to end them. Okay, huge fan. Thank you. Question, what did you mean when you said that yesterday you could have been bad for the short VIX trade, but now there's no need to adjust positioning? I think essentially what I meant was at one point yesterday, the market was actually going down. My volatility barometer made it all the way up to 56%. But just as of late, and let me just check now so I don't sound like, um, what? Oh, it's actually, <laughs> look at that. Just as I'm speaking, the market's flat now. See, it was up about 0.8% an hour ago when I said that. It's flat now. But what I basically was getting at is that there was a little bit of a shakeout and then everything's normal. Turns out it's not so normal. We're still at that somewhat precarious level where we are, as certainly in one of our strategies, we're bouncing in and out of the threshold. So we were out of SPY into cash. Now we're out of cash into SPY. 
whatever happens on Monday, we'll see. We'll take it as it comes. But we could very well be out of SPY right back into cash. You never know. Uh, that's trading. You got to get your money in the market. Uh, from the moment you allocate capital forward is a complete unknown. It doesn't mean you just randomly do stuff. Of course, we do the best we can. But uh, you can't control forward pricing. So that's what I meant. Is SVIX built the same way as the old XIV? So what you'd want to do here, because I could never do it justice in a quick little YouTube questioning, what you want to do here is go to the live stream. I called it something like new. Come on. There we go. Episode 36, I went through a full breakdown, like a 20 minute presentation about why SVIX is different than the old XIV and the, the underlying index that it uses, the advantages to the short vol versus the old SPVIX STR, all that stuff. So instead of me just going off on a abbreviated and inferior rant here, um, go ahead and check out that episode 36 volatility barometer and you'll learn everything you need to know about SVIX in that episode. But this super short cop-out answer, it's built differently. It is better. SVIX is better than the old XIV. It's a safer, better rebalancing system. So, but I mean, exposure-wise, it's the same. It's one times inverse front two-month VIX futures. What mathematical technique are you employing to, you're trying to basically recreate my barometer, aren't you? All your questions are just getting progressively closer to just saying, just send me your spreadsheet. So at some point, we're going to cross the proprietary line here, I think. Um, pass. I never pass. Like the, the, amount, the level that you have to get to get me to say, I'm not going to just give you the spreadsheet, right? The reason behind me asking about the min-max barometer is that your work relies on percentile rank. It, it does, but when you, when you stretch it all out and add it up, of course, it's never really going to work out that way. I think I, I, think I, might, um, I think I might have to rework it. it just, I just get too many questions. It's awkward to look at for other people, so... At the very least, I'm not going to send you my spreadsheet, but I, I will take your advice on this one and see if I can make it make more sense. Oh, my lightsaber burnt out. How long ago did that happen? The light in the background. I can see it. It burnt out. Um, I'm, should, um, I'm new. We should always short and put VXX or UVXY as they always go down just for a few week it up. Try to fill in some of the blanks here. So you're new. You're under the impression that it always goes down. But you're wondering time frame. I mean, essentially, okay, so as a new trader coming into the short vol space, you've probably been inundated with people telling you that it's basically an ATM machine. And all you do is short vol because, of course, we've all seen this countless times. Wow, like what kind of moron doesn't just short this with both hands and just make a million dollars every year, right? Well, the problem is risk reward in the, in the investment world is, is not symmetrical, right? You go through several weeks, several months even of easy success with the short vol trade, pretty much no matter what structure you use. Even the rookies out there who do sell naked, you know, calls and stuff like that, super capital inefficient. I don't know why people do that. Super high risk. It makes no sense at all. But they do because Twitter and, you know, TikTok and all that stuff. So whatever. I'll do my best to help, you know, as they say, a thousand true fans. I can't change the world, but people who watch my live streams, I'll get you in much more efficient trades than that. But um, what ends up happening, of course, with investing is you get a bunch of easy wins and you think everything's great, but the losses are so much more punishing than the gains help you. So you can wipe out weeks or months of your progress in the short vol trade, simply over allocating to something or using a bad structure like a naked call, and you can get wiped out pretty quickly. So what I would suggest you do is, because you said you're new, 
I always, I, sometimes I get a bad rap. Like I, people think I'm talking them out of shorting volatility. I'm not, I'm the short vol guy. I've been doing this for, you know, when was my first public article? Probably 2010. And I was sharing my performance back in 2008. I was, I had a, my original website was called VIX Trader. I've been sharing my short vol performance for almost 15 years now on public websites. I'm the short vol guy. I'm just trying to get people to do it in a way that's not going to blow up in their face because I've had emails that, you know, make me, make me want to cry. People talking about how they lost their life savings, their wife left them, they're, you know, they're, they're going to lose their kids. They're, they're thinking of doing something terrible, you know, taking a permanent solution to a temporary problem, if you know what I mean. Um, I'm the guy that gets those emails. So I have to clean up the mess of all these people on Twitter who are just doing it to get followers and they're just doing it to drum up, you know, excitement. Uh, they're, they're not, they, they don't care. They don't have any compassion for the, the just wrecking ball of destruction that that's going to have when these events every couple of years happen, right? Everything's high fives and great when we're on 194 days of contango. Any blindfolded monkey can make money shorting vol in this environment. But what happens when you get volpocalypse? What happens when you get... Q4 2018. What happens when you get a European debt crisis? These things happen. So um, yes, I'm always encouraging people to dedicate a portion of their portfolio to the short vol trade. It is the most highly profitable, the most mathematical way to make money that I know of, right? It's the least guesswork. It's the most math-based. Everybody should be doing this. How you do it is gonna make or break your, your long-term success. So of course, if you, maybe I read this wrong because I do feel like there's a, there's a little bit missing, apologies. Where is that? Did it disappear? Um, I didn't quite get exactly what you were saying, but I don't think you're ready to jump in with serious capital or short vol trading just yet. So what I would say is you take it way down to like 5% of your portfolio, something in that range, and if you're trading options, defined risk only. If you're trading the ETFs, never short, only use the inverse ones. So use the SVXY to short vol and use the VXZ to go long vol or the VIXM. And that's your system. That's your long short system. Short vol is SVXY, long vol is VIXM. 5% of your portfolio, record all your results, get out a spreadsheet, record every trade, record every thought you have and trial and error, right? Do more of what's working, less of what isn't. And over time, you're going to come out ahead. But it does strike me as you are somebody who has been a little bit too influenced by the people that say it always goes down. It does not always go down. It can go for multiple years, not going down, right? So careful, please be careful. I'll always be there to help. You want to email me and we'll get more specific, we can do that. But uh, as for right now, you don't seem ready. What is your opinion on utilizing stock buying power, which is usually two times the underlying value of options approved account, to double the allocation to do some of VTS strategies? No, because we already use leverage. No, of course not. I, did you watch last week's live stream? I went through the pitfalls of using leverage. We're already using two times the NASDAQ. We're already using short vol. And you might think, oh, SVXY, it's, it's watered down. It doesn't move. Really? Because I track the beta factor. It moves just fine. It moves more than the S&P 500, right? The SVXY is, has a beta of 1.36, long-term beta of 1.74, I think. So long-term, this thing moves. Um, and then the SPY, as you know, we just recently, just two days ago, three days ago, deleveraged this, but we were using two times there. So if you go into your account and you start using buying power to leverage the QLD, which is already leveraged, well, now you're four times leveraged. It's going to be nothing but high fives in 2023. Like, let me, let me pull up some numbers here. Oh, that's the wrong spreadsheet. I'm going to have to go by memory. So I think our defensive rotation strategy made something like 60% return in 2021. I think it lost something around 30 something, 2022, and it's up 70 or something this year. So maybe up 
up 60, down 35, up 70, right? Long-term crushing it. So you're going to use leverage and margin. And what you're going to end up doing is the losing year, because of the way that the math works on losses are so much more punishing than the gains, you could have a system where doing it the way that I present it to VTS, you'd make 60, lose 35, make 70. You're up a ton. But if you use leverage, you would make a bunch more in 2021. Maybe you'd make 120. But that loss in 2022 is now way amplified. And you would actually probably be down worse than if you didn't use the leverage. And then in 2023, you'd be crushing it. Instead of 70, you'd be up 140, something like a little bit less, but maybe 120. It's not going to recover from the drawdown because you used four times leverage and that drawdown is insanely punishing, right? It's, it's exponential to the downside. So adding leverage is almost always a bad idea. Check out last week's live stream. I mean, this is what we went through, basically. I showed the numbers of, if you're trading just the single QQQ, this is the single NASDAQ, it's pretty close to the all-time highs again, right? It's only, as of July 27th, it was only 8.5%. If you do the QLD, well, now you're 42% away from the all-time highs. That's the gearing effect of leverage. The downside punishment is worse than the upside gains. So we use the QLD, but our strategy is actually back to break even because we're systematic. And we actually, as I showed before, there are periods where we can we can go ahead and move out and we can actually go into utilities and you know we can do other things like cash and whatnot. But that's what's going to end up happening to you. So what about the TQQQ, the triple leveraged? This one's 113% away. And if you used your buying power, you can see I've got plenty of, where is my uh, buying power here? It's not even showing, is it? Well, whatever. Um, I've always got plenty of, hold on a second. I'm going to have to check that. That buying power doesn't look like it adds up correctly. But anyway, I think that's because I've got some naked positions on because of the... Um, the wheel of fun. I'm actually, the live stream is of course not at market close. So I've been opening some strong negative positions. Yeah, that's what it is. Anyway, the point is if you're going to be doing triple leverage, now look what you've done to yourself. You're miles away from breaking even. And then if there was a four times cues, that thing would be, you know, potentially years away from breaking even. So leverage sounds like a great idea in a bull market. And you just find out so quickly and painfully in a bear market or a down period, just what a disaster leverage can be. So I'm the conservative guy. I, VTS is just my money, right? I'm sorry if it sounds selfish, but that's what it is. It's not a subscription to drum up interest to get other people to pay me money. It's me trading my own account, 100% selfish. I'm going to do the best I can with my own net worth and by proxy, if I'm doing well, then everybody who follows me is doing well. But I don't do anything with the VTS just to be flashy and cool. If I turned the tactical volatility into a short UVXY call strategy naked, I'd probably double my subscription base. But I mean, that would just be insane. That's just terrible. And uh, I'm a much better trader than that. So um, I already use strategic leverage. It's enough. Trust me. It's enough. Yeah, this is interesting. When I started the live stream, everything was looking normal. And now it does appear we are going to have to get out of... Well, not yet. Not yet. But um, possible. 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 Um, okay. Talking heads and volatility. I know guys that push short vol products on YouTube, but when I asked them about Volpocalypse, they had never even heard about it. Well, this... I mean, the volatility space is just rampant with this. That, look this is the fad trade, right? So in good times, and we've been in, as I showed, we've been in VIX futures contango for 194 days. The number of YouTube videos you're going to start to see pop up about how easy it is to short volatility, the number of clowns on Twitter who are going to be ramping up their, oh my God, I just made 100% type of stuff. It just gets exponential when you get a period of calm. And then of course, as soon as something terrible happens, crickets, they're all gone, deleted tweets, videos get taken down. What, what, what vol spike? I don't know. Volpocalypse? What are you talking about? No, I didn't tell you to get into that trade. I would never sell naked calls on UVXY. Are you crazy? That's what's going to end up happening, right? 
you follow these people, you go right off a cliff, and then when it crashes, they don't have to give back their followers. They don't have to give back their YouTube views. They don't have to give back the money they made when they sold those stupid courses to you. You are gonna be carrying the full brunt of those losses. So careful. When, when we've been in a long period of calm and 2023 has been a relatively easy trading year, you're just going to get so much bad advice surfacing because that's where the eyeballs are going to go. And as soon as there's problems, yeah. And also a lot of people because of this, they're just jumping around. So I don't know what the exact statistic is, but I've heard something like 70%. And that was about five years ago. I don't know what it is now, but at the time, you know, in 2018, we'll say 70% of asset managers started their career after the financial crisis, right? So only 30% of asset managers back then had ever had a true sustained crisis. You might think, oh, they went through the pandemic. Well, yeah, the government spent $7 trillion to get us out of that like very quickly. But the financial crisis was something that very few people have seen. And now going back 2023, it's probably even worse, probably like 80, 90% of asset managers, financial advisors, they've never really seen anything but super quick reversals, bull market, bear market. They've never seen anything outside that. So a lot of vol volatility traders, probably 90% of them, they weren't trading back in February, 2018. They had no idea what it was. That's why I've made a couple of videos where I've actually showed my actual thinkorswim trading account showing in 2010, just top to bottom lists, pages of short volatility trades with VXX, XIV and VIX options. That's 12, 13, 14 years ago. I can show my actual trading account. If you're gonna follow somebody who's talking about these reckless things, right? You know, all the things that you hear it and you think, Really? That sounds bad, right? Your intuition is going to tell you that sounds risky, but he's got a big following on Twitter, so he must be right. You know what you need to do? You need to just ask that person directly. Show me your first month of trading that you were actually using the volatility products you're talking about. You're telling people to short calls on whatever it is. You're making YouTube videos. Okay, let's see it. Let's see how much experience you actually have. I don't think they can go very far back. In, in a lot of cases, they could probably only show you a year or less. So um, again, if somebody's talking about an overlay strategy, you need to see what that overlay is. Don't read the marketing material. When somebody's telling you about short volatility trades, you need to see some history of them actually being around 10 years ago. Show me your articles that you were writing. Show me your presence back then. Anybody who's good at this, it takes years and years to get really good at this, to be an expert at volatility. They should be able to very easily demonstrate that they've been talking consistently for years about the same thing, trading for years. You need to see that. Otherwise, you're probably dealing with somebody who, you know, is just jumping on a short-term fad. And nearly 200 days of, of consistent contango, they're just going to be coming out of the woodwork now. It's going to be dangerous place on Twitter. TikTok's probably a nightmare. What about SKU? I don't use SKU. I think it's terribly structured. Sometimes it's good, but broken clocks right twice a day. The SKU index is probably, you know, not measuring what it's intending to measure. So just ignore it. I, I don't even record the numbers anymore. I used to track it in my spreadsheet and just add it, but it's so useless. I don't even use it. Well, I'll never conquer the puzzle. <laughs> I'm looking to fill fundamental gaps. Well, like I said, I'll try to help you right when we're dancing on the proprietary edge, right? When I'm on that line and I say, look, if I go any further, you're basically Mr. VTS. Uh, when we get to that point, I have to politely say um, no. But I'll try to help as much as I can. I think your blue neon light on the shelf just burnt out. There we go. I lost both lightsabers. Look at that. Thought I was all cool. You know, the YouTube look with the dark background and the lightsabers. They both burnt out. In all the metrics where you measure the percentile between M1 and M2, how far back do you go? And from what period do you measure? Or is it one year? So what I do is I go all the way back to March 26, 2004 for the VIX futures, because that's when they launched. And it sounds like a long period, 
but that's actually not a whole lot of data yet, right? When you're talking about actual robust market data, you'd probably want to see 30, 40 years. We've only got 20 or less with most of these volatility metrics. So anytime possible, I'm going to drag it back as far as I can. I think March 26, 2004, it's a pretty, pretty good date to start. It's got a very impressive streak of contango. Remember the 293 or 278, whatever the record is, it was back in 2005. Then you got the financial crisis. You've got all those other things like the flash crash and the European debt crisis. Then we've got the pandemic. I think a good mix of bull and bear markets is always warranted. Now, if we had, say, a, a massive financial crisis in the next few years, at that point, I might want to skip the first one because then the, the metrics might be too heavily skewed for two big financial crises plus a pandemic and less bull market than bear market. You kind of want to get a balance of the two to get the good percentiles going. Right now, I feel like it's just perfect. Get everything back to 2004 to 2006 if you can. And uh, that's the most robust data. There will come a time when I have to make decisions, but hopefully by then I'm old and gray and a mega millionaire and all of the people who followed me or we're all on our yachts and everything will be beautiful. Hopefully by then we won't really care about the data set. But as of right now, the longer, the better. Last question. Why would you short VIX with money coverage 100%? Short when 80 or 60, because it's hard to be 160 or 120. So are you, sorry, live streams are tough sometimes. I, I can oftentimes misinterpret the questions. Are you suggesting that you should wait until the VIX hits 60 or 80 and then just short it with everything you've got? Uh, the one thing that you should know is it's only ever gone over 60 twice, right? The financial crisis, it went over 60, it went to 80. And then in the pandemic, it went to 82. Actually, in the financial crisis intraday, it went to 82 as well. Um, but that's not the limit, all right? So if you drag that back a few years further, we have VIX data going back to 1990. It actually launched in 1993, but we can drag it back to 1990. But before that, when they used the S&P 100 and what's called the VXO, that was the old VIX calculation. If you use that and you go back another four years, you include Black Monday, right? 1987, October 1987. The VIX back then, the VXO, went to 172 intraday and it settled at 150. So it went from 32 to 150, close to close, or 32 to 172, including intraday. So don't be confused by the fact that the VIX might have a ceiling at 100. There's no limit to what it can do. It's just, it's just a statistic of the S&P 500 options market. That's all it is. And whatever it is, it is. Whatever that number is, it is. So if you tried to get this type of system, while it's true that if it gets that high, it's probably almost certainly coming down soon. The problem is you only get two instances of trades in the last 25 years. And second, if it gets to 60 or 80, it could go to 150. So then what? You're waiting for your once every 15 year entry point and it crushes you anyway. So this is just a, not a good strategy to have. What you want to do is you want to have much more occurrences than that. I actually showed my long volatility, you know, the 80th percentile threshold in the barometer. You can see this is 80 right here. It doesn't flash often, but it's enough, right? This is a rolling three-year chart. I'm getting some instances where I'm getting that trade in. And sometimes they're very short-lived. False positive, you get in two days later, it's, it's a dud and you lose a little bit of money and you get out. But you want more trade occurrences than just two every 20 years. And secondly, you certainly don't want to take a trade that you waited 15 years for and it still crushed you. And that's the problem with short vol is that there is no ceiling to it. There is no, okay, I'm, I'm totally safe at 60, right? It's, you know, maybe it'll go to 80, but then it's back down. Maybe not. We don't know the future. So don't take risky trades during the highest risk period in the market. That's why I say it's actually counterintuitive for people, but you should not short volatility when the VIX is at 60. You should be long volatility when the VIX is at 60. I mean, you might get shaken out of that trade, but 
That's where the money's made, continuation of a trend. So when the signals get above that, so, or in this case, below the third percentile, go ahead and take your long vol. That's not the short vol signal. It's actually the opposite. So one more question popped. I really should call this. It's been almost two hours. I don't know why today there's been so many questions. If everybody who's watching, and there's still several of you hanging around, everybody hit the like button. It's staring right at you. I know you can do it. There's less than half of the likes compared to the number of people who are watching this. Um, okay. Let's this, make this one truly the last one. In all the metrics where you measure the percentile, I already asked, I already answered that. You, an, you asked that up there and then it, it doubled up for some reason. So I am done. Let's wrap it up. It's an hour 45. This should have been just one hour, but I feel like pretty solid. We, uh, we jumped into a new wheel of fun trade, which was cool. And the market is going down. So <laughs> that question about whipsaw, we might have to revisit that one nah, next Friday. Um, yeah, we'll see where things land on Monday. But uh, thanks everybody for tuning in and there will definitely be one next Friday. So uh, we will see you in a week.